So section 5.8 is about fractional coefficients. And you've seen this before. We've even already analyzed this concept. But we're going to take a look at it, and then we're going to also look um, and see what happens with some word problems that involve this. And the word problems can be a little trickier than the just simple equation. So our rule is simply going to be multiply the equation by the LCD of the whole thing. Okay? So remember in the last section, method 2 is the one that everybody seemed to like. Method 2 was the, set, was the type that we used. Well, in that case, what we did was we found the LCD, and then we multiplied the expression on the top and bottom by the LCD, because it was an expression. Here it's an equation. So by multiplying everything by the LCD, we're multiplying both sides of the equation by the LCD. Like we multiplied both parts of the fraction by the LCD in the last section. So the concept is the same here still. So let's look at an example. What's the LCD in this problem? What's the LCD in this problem? 18? How do you know that? And that works for 6 also, yeah. And if you didn't know, you should write the factorization of these numbers out. 9 is 3 by 3. 6 is 3 by 2. So if you get confused ever, just write out the factorization. Okay, I don't care about the numerator for now. Take a look at the factorization. If there's two 3's in one of them, there need to be two 3's in all of them. So I would start by doing this here and here. Okay, I'll leave whatever these, what was this? This was x, x squared, and 1, just so we have them there. Now, if there's a 2 in some of them, there needs to be 2 in all of them. So I put a 2 here, and I put a 2 here. Over here, let's see, I'm missing another 3, actually, I need on the far right. Okay, and as a result, we would have common denominators now for all of these. So if you ever get stuck, or you fumble along the way, you don't know what the common denominator is, start by listing the prime factorization, and then see what's missing from all the terms. But yes, as Luca mentioned, 18 is definitely our common denominator. So we get 2x squared minus 3x equals 9. Now, this would all be over what? This would all be over what? Yeah, both sides would be over 18. So technically, if both sides are over 18, technically I don't really need the 18 there. Okay? I really don't need the 18. Well, that's the same thing as if, and I'll show you what I mean. Now I'll give you that look. If I had this right, this is over 18, and this is technically over 18 also. If I divide both sides by 18, that has no effect on the problem. I could get rid of that by multiplying both sides by 18. Well, this result right here is the same thing you would get if you just started the problem by finding the LCD and multiplying everything by 18 to start. Okay, so if you multiply the whole thing by 18 to start instead, like that, which is not like, obviously something you want to think about, multiply both sides by 18 really, but that's what you're doing. If you did that, you would get this equation that's circled down here. And do it, check. 18x squared over 9. Right, 18x squared over 9. That's just 2x squared. 18x over 6. That's just 3x. And then 18 over 2 is just 9. So the method that we're going to use here is really finding a common denominator, seeing that's on both sides and canceling. But instead of doing that every time, we just identify the common denominator, multiply through, and it gets us right to this answer nice and quick. Okay, do you see how this technique works? By multiplying by the LCD, it gets rid of all the denominators, giving you this equation down here. So this is the equation we need to solve now. So let's go ahead and do that. I move the 9 over, and I have to factor this, or use the quadratic formula. Can we come up with factors for this? It does factor. Negative 6 and 3. Negative 6 and 3. Not negative well, 6 and 3. Factor. It's alright. 2x plus 3 and x minus 3. Let's take a look. If we foiled it out, 
we'd get 2x times negative 3, which is negative 6x, and a positive 3x gives us negative 3x. That's good. And then 3 times negative 3 is negative 9. So that works for me. Okay, if you had trouble, what method should you use? AC. Okay, if you have trouble doing this by inspection, use AC method, please. Right now, as a result, if we want to solve this, we're going to get x equals 3 halves, and x e negative 3 halves, and x equals 3. Would either of these cause a denominator to be undefined, or for a denominator to be 0? Look at the original. Did the original have any x's in the denominator? So we don't have any domain restrictions, right? In section 5.9, which we're going to do after the test, that's going to be kind of the beginning of your last test. In section 5.9, we're going to have domain restrictions because we're going to look at problems with these variables in the denominator. Okay? So when we take a look at this, we have two possible answers here. Now, had you used the quadratic formula instead, you would get from here right down to here. So you don't really need to factor in this example. You could use the quadratic formula. All right. Same thing. Do it the same way. Try this one on your own. Find the LCD, multiply by the LCD, solve the inequality. But yeah, it's the only So what's the LCD in this problem? 12, 12 right? So let's multiply everything by 12. Now, when you multiply by 12, just simply put a 12 in the numerator. Please don't distribute the 12, because you can reduce it. That's the whole concept. Again, do not distribute the 12. The first term, we get 12 over 4 reduces to just simply 3. So this is now 3x minus 42. Then we have the 12 cancels with this 12 right here, leaving me just the 5x, and 3 times 12 is 36. Okay, now we have an inequality. Go ahead and solve. Go ahead and solve this inequality, please. See what you get as a result. What do you get for x? What's the solution set here? Luca? x is less than or equal to negative 3. Good. Okay, you're going to get x less than or equal to negative 3. All right. Now, I wrote it that way, obviously, because the way it was written here with the inequality, but if you had it the other way, you just divide it by a negative and cause you to flip the sign. How about the third one here? How about the third Try this third one. You're going to have a little bit of a hiccup along the way. Don't give up on it as you go through it, please.
What happens when you multiply through by that LCD? What kind of an equation do you get here? Right. Yeah, you're going to get a quad uh, inequality. Yeah, quad sorry, sorry, equation. You get a quadratic, good, Niall. Quadratic inequality. Remember, find the critical points, test the regions on the number line to see where your solution, your solution set should be shaded. Should be on my desk. Okay. Thanks, man. Say again? Should should be Um you should have not have to round actually, right? Let's see. Well what did you get point three repeating? Negative point three repeating is one of your roots or critical points. I'm gonna multiply by six everywhere, giving me three s squared minus eight s greater than three. It's all right. I'll put up the solution though. I should write it up. So we have 3s squared minus 8s greater than uh, minus 3 greater than 0. And it's factors into 3s plus 1. s minus 3. Give me s equals negative 1 third. Real quick and then get back to that. Yeah. And then s equals 3. So these are my critical points here I have to identify. If those are my critical points, and I've got the negative one-third over here, I've got the three over here. I test my regions. In the process of testing, I end up getting positive, negative, positive. Well, I go back and I look at the equation. I wanted to know when this quadratic was greater than zero. Greater than zero means positive, so I'm shading the regions that are positive. So I shade this region. Open circle, shade this region with an open circle. So my solution set should say the following. S is less than negative one third, or S is greater than three. Again, S is less than negative one third, or S is greater than, that's a three there. And those are both threes that are kind of squiggly. What we'll do is we'll stop here, and then when we get back from the, well, a while, it's going to be until I see you guys again, when we get back from the next four or five days, we'll do the last two examples in this section on here, okay? If you struggled on this quiz, please. Luca, please go for it. Thanks, bud. Zach Cook collected the same amount of money from each member participating in a trip to a baseball game. He said this is statistics and all. When six members come down to ten, each remaining member was charged two dollars more to cover the total cost of the trip of three hundred and sixty dollars. How many members went to the game? Okay, how many members actually went to the game here? It's not an easy problem to start, but look, we are gonna have some sort of fractional coefficient involved, so that's where it's gonna come in play. Uh, take about a minute or two and think about what you would do to start a problem like this. Okay, think about maybe using a let statement to help you if you're struggling at some point. 
And think about how you could use a let statement here. And if you're having trouble, you can also think about just picking numbers. Say like, you know, I don't know, 25 kids are in that club. And then after that it says, what, well, six fewer couldn't go? You know, six members come out of 10. So then you have 19 left. Think about those numbers and how those are applied. is asking how many members how many members actually went to the game okay how many members went to the game so what should I do first in a problem like this when asked how many members went to the game um, equals m. m equals what m equals, the m equals I can't hear you sorry M equals the number of members, yes, that ended up going to the game. So start with your let statement. Okay, the number of members attending. All right, now, how would I write some sort of an equation or make a statement that relates this right here? How would I utilize that statement and write some sort of a mathematical expression that represents that? When six members could not attend, the cost, or sorry, each remaining member was charged two dollars more to cover the total cost of the trip. Cover the total cost of the trip. So if it normally costs you twenty bucks to go, right? Suddenly six people can't go and it costs you twenty-two dollars. So somehow write some sort of an expression or equation, an equation relating to two or three or four expressions that could show this. Yeah, that's exactly right. Now, you can put those two into one equation, though. So you're, you're making two different statements. Try and make that into one equation only. Yeah, go ahead, Sabine. What, what, what are you actually getting at? How could you say that in words or with an equation, but just simply one equation? Very close. Sabine's really close. She's on the right track here. If you wanted to find out the... Cost, so the total cost is 360, right? We see that? That's why she's doing 360 divided by. If there were 20 of you in the math club and the cost was 360, how would you figure out how to get the cost per person? Yeah, you would just divide the two, right? 360 divided by 20. Is that clear? Right? 18 bucks a person? So it would be 360 divided by M minus 6. Divided by? M minus 6. M minus 6, where is that going? On the left hand side, on the right hand side, where? So under here you're saying do that? Yeah. Okay. 
And then tell me what else I would do then. We could start with that. That works. Why m minus 6? Where's that coming from? Okay. Depends on your let statement, though, Mike. You said the let statement m is the number of members actually attending. Yeah, right? This should be just divided by the actual amount of people that are attending here. Again, it depends on your let statement. If you made your let statement different, it might be different. But this would be 360 divided by m is the actual cost per person. And it's $2 more than the cost would have been, right? It's $2 more than, right, so plus 2. $2 more than the cost would have been. What would the cost have been if everybody was going, and those six people didn't back out? What would the cost per person have been then? 360 over n plus 6. Yeah. Very right, good. Let's go over that. If 30 people ended up going, n is 30. Well, that means that 360 divided by 30 would be the same thing as 360 divided by, say, 30 plus 6, the 36 that were originally going, or 50 people. But in the end, what you're noticing is that when there's more people, right, there's more people here, it's a lower cost. So that cost per person plus $2 gives you the higher cost. So if I were writing words out, okay, I would write the, this would be like the actual cost. Okay, the actual cost. Um, this would be like the original cost plus, what do you want to call that, like a surcharge? Not a surcharge, but the extra charge of $2 per person. And make sense of it. Okay, the original cost, let's say you're going on a field trip, the original cost is $8 per person. And suddenly it's $2 more. You just do 8 plus 2 to give you the actual cost of $10. Okay, so the actual cost is $360 divided by how many people actually end up going. The original cost is 360 divided by not the amount that ended up going, but that amount that ended up going, plus 6 that were originally going to go, plus the $2 that you're going to have to pay as a surcharge. Look, everything's per person. 360 over n is the price per person. 360 over n plus 6 is the original price per person. Plus $2 per person. It's all per person. Yeah, your dimensions are actually consistent throughout. This is the question he was asking. If it was a group cost, these are costs per people though. 360 is not, that's the group cost, right? 360 over n is the cost per person. The current cost per person. This was the original cost per person, plus the two dollars is what gives you the current cost per person. Okay, so I'll point if it helps. So this is how much we were paying, right, originally. Then six people dropped, which means now we're paying this much. Well, it's the original cost plus two dollars. That's what this says, two dollars more per person. You could also have done this using m minus 6 and m as well. And what would have happened is you would have to make this m and make this an m minus 6. And then m would be defined as the number of members originally attending. See the difference there? If I put the word originally right here, then I can make this m minus, or sorry, m, and make this m minus 6. Because six fewer people ended up attending. All right, so looking at this now, what we're going to recognize is that we have an equation with some sort of fraction involved, right? We want to get rid of that fraction here. So what should I do? What should I do? How could I solve this? M plus 6. Okay, that'll clear out this denominator for sure, right? If I multiply m plus 6 here, those cancel. This becomes 2 times the quantity m plus 6. But the m plus 6 doesn't cancel this m. So we need something else. m plus 6 is partially there. Remember, the method in this section is to identify the least common denominator and then multiply everything by that. In this case, m plus 6 is not the least common denominator. It's 
squared plus 6. So close. Not m squared plus 6. M squared plus 6m, or just simply put m parentheses m plus 6. The, the, the two things that are in denominators right now, here and here, remember, if they're both different factors, their product is the LCD. So let's start by writing that down. The LCD is m, m plus 6. Okay, again, it's the product of your denominators. Remember the whole trick here, or the whole idea of getting a least common denominator, is to factor everything, factor everything as far as possible. Well, these are already factored. M plus 6 is a factor. M is a factor. The 2 is over 1. 1 is a factor, really. So let's multiply everything by M, M plus 6. So that's the left-hand side of the equation. The right-hand side is this. Okay, again, we multiply both the left and the right-hand side by the quantity m, m plus 6, because that is the common denominator here. It's the product of the denominators when factored. Okay, assuming there's no common factors, obviously. <coughs> So what happens? We go ahead and we multiply through. On the left-hand side, the m's cancel, leaving behind 360m plus, what is that going to be, 2160, 216 with an extra zero on it. Okay, so again, we take this 360, we multiply it through to both of these, giving us 360m plus 2160. How about on the right-hand side? How about on the right-hand side? What do I have to do on the right-hand side? You have to put 2 over 1. To put 2 over 1, okay, that helps me to start, yeah. And then? What do you mean multiply it out? Use a word that we should be using here. Distribute. Good. Distribute to both, thank you. Times two. times two. Okay, notice this. When you distribute, when I distribute this boxed in term here to the first term, the m plus six here and the m plus six here cancel. So cancel these mentally, leaving behind 360 times m right here. Then m times m plus six carries over the second term, make it m m plus six times two. And I have an equation now with no denominators involved. So it makes it a lot easier. What might I want to recognize? What might I want to recognize? Because in this example, we didn't have numerical denominators. We had variable denominators. So what do I have to recognize or identify here? It is a quadratic. That is something you notice. Yeah, that's one thing, but that was what I was thinking. But yeah, it is definitely a quadratic. What about just with the note? If you have a denominator with a variable, we're looking at fractional exponents, but look at the denominator. It's m's in it. What do we have to write down? We have to write down some sort of a restriction, and it's almost ridiculous to write it down. You'll see why, but we do have to note it. So m can't equal zero or negative six. M can't be zero or negative six. Now. That's because if it, m is 0, it makes this denominator 0, which makes it undefined. If m is negative 6, it makes this 0, which is undefined. So that's what we recognize. Why doesn't it really matter? Go ahead. Because you can't have negative numbers. Yeah, we're not going to end up having 0 members or negative 6 members. Okay, but we want to recognize this, and I'm just pointing it out. Because there are going to have times where you have to have some sort of a domain restriction. Okay, in this case, it won't matter because of the significance of the variable m that we've defined in our let statement. So let's go ahead and solve this equation right here. 360m is on both sides. What can I do with it? Okay. If I subtract 360m from both sides, it cancels off. And 
leaving me behind with 2160 equals. Now I'm going to distribute this m to both terms, making this m squared plus 6m all times 2 still. Why did I distribute that 2? Anybody recognize? Yeah, you can divide both by 2. Very good. Okay, making this 2160 into, what would that become? Let's see, 1080? Yeah. yeah. So divide both sides by 2 to get rid of that 2. Which gives me 0 equals m squared plus 6m minus 1080. Would you factor this on your own, honestly? Or would you probably do it at this point? Yeah, either the formula or the program, but I probably wouldn't even try to factor it. It is factorable, it turns out. Okay? You are going to get integer solutions um, for this quadratic equation here. But I, I probably wouldn't try and factor it just because it's going to be really messy. So we end up getting m equals negative 36 and m equals 30. Okay, so which means that your factors are clearly x plus 36, or sorry, m plus 36 and m minus 30. That's what your factors would become in this problem. So, if we take a look at this, clearly we can have a negative amount of math club members. So the answer for m is 30. m is the number of members that actually went. So that is the answer we're looking for. Remember, the question says, how many members actually went to the game? Which means we're actually looking for m in this problem. How many were supposed to go to the game? 36. Okay, 36 was supposed to go to the game. So tell me, what would the cost per ticket be if all 36 went? How much? $10 per ticket. 360 divided by 36 is $10 per ticket. But when 36 don't go, when 30 go, right, when 30 go, what's the cost per ticket? $12. $12. What's the difference between 10 and 12? Two. So $2 increase that we talked about at the beginning of the problem. Okay? Questions? Questions on this? Not an easy problem, okay? It's the approach that's the most difficult, really. The math, you know, can be tricky because you have a variable in the denominator, but it shouldn't be that difficult math-wise. It's the actual setup of it that can be a little bit complex. Uh, ben, read this one for us. A chemist wishes to obtain 500 milliliters of a 26% solution of hydrochloric acid by mixing 18% and 30% solutions, how much of each should be used? All right, now, good lesson for chemistry. Okay, you're going to do this. It's called titration. Titration is the mixing of two different uh, concentrations come up with the desired concentrations. So if you're in a chem lab and you need a 26% solution of hydrochloric acid, you might not have that available. But you do have an 18 and 30% solution. If it just happens to be the bottom of your map. And you don't always have every exact concentration. So you have to mix them in proportion. The question is, in what proportion do you mix them? Now, if I mix them evenly, 18% and 30%, and I mix them evenly, what percent solution will I get? If I take half of 18%, half of 30%, I get 24, which is the midpoint, right? Or the average of those two. What's halfway between 18 and 30 is 24. So if I mix those two things evenly, I'm going to get a 24% solution. Do I want a 24% solution? I want one that's greater than that. So I need more of the 30%. Is that obvious at least to see? I need to put more of the 30% solution than I do the 18%. So that it skews it toward 26%. The question is, how do I figure that out, right? Not me think. Am I going to sit there and try it over and over? No. Because I can't sit there and test my concentration. I need to know for certainty the way I'm doing this. So, um, an easy way to do this is to take a look at like a table that organizes this for you. Okay, this is something that you'll utilize in chemistry. And we're going to see here that we're going to have fractional coefficients, but they're going to appear as decimals. But again, decimals are really fractions. So let's take a look at this. Again, what are we trying to figure out? We're trying to figure out the amount of each of these concentrations. So we have to start with a let statement. So it doesn't matter, just for the sake of, um, what's the word, consistency with your notes, if you check your notes and look at the written part later, let's let x be defined as the 18% solution. 
Okay, it could be the 18% or the 30% solution, either one, because your goal is to find both of those values. So let x equal the number of milliliters of the 18% solution. Now, if I get the answer for x is 200, if I get 200, I get that next X. What does that tell me about my values of 18% and 30% solutions? What would they be if X came out to be 200? Well, they would be about 30 If X turned out to be 200 as a number, what would the answers be that I give? Maybe 200 milliliters for 18% and 300. I mean, yeah, maybe milliliters for 300. Yeah. Again, if I get 200 for the 18%, the other 300 totaling up to 500 milliliters would give us the final solution. So if x is defined as that, then technically speaking, isn't 500 minus x the other solution? Right? If you get 200 for this answer, the only reason you got 300 is because 500 minus 200 is what gives you 300, really. So technically speaking, we could really define another thing. We could say 500 minus x is the number of milliliters of 30% solution. Okay, we don't have to write that necessarily, but it is going to come up in our table, so I'm just going to define it for now, so we're all clear on that. So if x, again, is the total of 18% solution, take that away from 500, you get what's left over for the 30% solution. Okay, for the 30% solution. Now, Let's make a table together, and let's do this. In your table, let's put four columns and four rows. Or three rows and a title, it doesn't matter, but we're going to write above the table there. Okay, we'll call this the milliliters of solution. We'll call this percent acid in solution. And we'll call this the milliliters of acid. Now, over here on the left-hand side, we've got three things. We've got the 18%, the 30% solution, and the final mixture, which is a 26% solution. Okay, for a lot of these, well, I shouldn't say a lot, I should say pretty much all. For these mixing problems, this approach could always be taken. Okay, it's an easy approach to use, so I'm going to teach it to you, but you should be able to apply this. Okay, so this is how we start. The two solutions that we have, the final solution, which is really 26%, the amount of milliliters of each of these solutions we're going to use, the percent acid in the solution, and the amount of milliliters of acid. And let's think about this logically. The number of milliliters used of the final solution. How many milliliters are there of the final solution in the end? 500. So let's put that in here. Well, the 18% solution, how many milliliters would it end up using? Not 500 minus x. What is it? It's just x. The other one is. Be careful there. This is x. This is 500 minus x. Again, if I use 200 milliliters of this solution, I say 500 minus 200 would give me 300 for this one. But again, these two things have to sum up to give me this. The x would cancel, making 500 equals 500, which makes sense. So vertically, those are going to add up. Then, the percent acid of each solution. What percent acid are these? I mean, it's pretty obvious. It's in the actual title. So if I were to write this as a decimal, for each of these. What would I write for the first column? Or for the first row? Yeah, 0 0.18. The second one? 0 0.3. And finally, 0 0.26. That's the percent of acid in each of these. This is how much, how many milliliters. This is the percent of acid per milliliter. So, if I know this is the percent acid per milliliter, and this is the number of milliliters, if I multiply these two, it'll give me the exact milliliters of acid in that solution. And the way to visualize this is as following. 
Draw yourself a little, I don't know, a little cup somewhere. Let's put it over here in the top right. Okay, we've got some fluid inside this cup. What does 30% acid really mean? It means that 30% of that fluid is acid. So it would look like this, if I could separate the acid out. This bottom 30% would all be acid in there. And everything above it would simply be some sort of solution, water, something that's neutral, if you will. Okay, that's acid water. But you have a neutral of 70% in red, 30% of it is acid. That's the 30% solution. So that's physically what I'm seeing. That's what this last color means. When I see milliliters of acid, if the whole thing was 10 milliliters, this would be, again, if this cup was 10 milliliters, we would have 3 milliliters of acid, and we would have 7 milliliters of some neutral solution. That's physically what would happen. Okay, throw 3 milliliters of that, of that milliliters of acid, 7 milliliters of the neutral solution. So that's what we're seeing here. We're trying to figure out how many milliliters of the acid are we going to get. Well, if this was 10 milliliters, we got 3 by taking 10 and multiplying by 0.3. So let's multiply across. So this is going to become 0.18x, 0.3 times the quantity 500 minus x, and 0.26 times 500. Now, as a result, the number of milliliters of acid in the end we can get is 500 times 0.26. It's an actual physical value here. Okay, 500 times 0.6, what are we going to end up having for that? One, 130? Okay, half of it. So we know that we need 130 milliliters of acid. Well, if we know that this is a certain amount of milliliters of acid, and so is this, and we're putting them together, we could take those two values, sum them together to give us this third value right here. So as a result, we can write this out as an equation. 0.18x plus 0.3 times the quantity 500 minus x equals 130. Now, why is this considered an equation with a fractional exponent? I don't see fractions anymore. Don't see fractions anyway. Yeah, they're really like over a hundred, right? So in reality, what should we do here? Might be useful to do. Multiply everything by hundred. Yeah, multiply everything by hundred. You get rid of that. Okay, so if I multiply everything by hundred, this becomes eighteen x. This becomes a thirty now. Five hundred minus x. This becomes thirteen thousand. So we got 18x because I move two spots, I multiply by 100, I multiply this whole thing by 100, move it two spots, makes it 30. I leave this alone again because remember these are factors. If I multiply this whole thing by 100, I just multiply the front by 100. I'm not distributing to everything because there's no plus sign right here. There's no plus or minus sign between the point three and the parentheses. Multiplying this by 100 just tap on two zeros. Okay, and go ahead and solve. You don't really need to clear out decimals if you don't want to. Decimals are really pretty easy to work with, so if you wanted to leave it the way it was, you can, but just to show you that this is a fractional coefficient. Okay, so we'll end up with 18x here. 30 times 500, we're going to get 15, and then with three zeros, minus 30x equals 13,000. Moving this over, I'm going to get negative 2,000 equals negative 12x. What do we get for x as a result? What do we get for x as a result? What's 2,000 over 12 going to give us? Right? Okay, 166 and two-thirds of a milliliter is the value of x. What is x again? Yeah, the milliliter is the 18% solution. So how much is left over for the 30% solution?
333.3. Where's that coming from? Okay, and that's the 30% solution. Notice, by the way, just to find it, finish, we said in the beginning we're going to need more of the 30% solution to skew this to be a 26% solution instead of the average, which would be 24. Hey, practice tonight, please. Rest. Okay, keep up with your work.